well, here we are, Monday morning, start of another week. Can't win bad out there now. I mean, that's one good thing. A bit of trouble rain yesterday. But uh, there we are. I mean, that does sort of, it's good for the gardens in here. I hope everybody's okay. And staying safe, that's the most important of all. Anyhow, of course, next week the clocks go back. So that's one good thing. Uh, lighter mornings, and but darker evenings. So. And we're out this just the way it is. Way it is, and we'll be all right. We'll be all right. Now I have got two birthdays today. One is a dear friend of mine called Peter Day. Up there in Somerset. Happy birthday to you, Howard. And have a nice day. And the other one is to a relation of mine, Sam Page. And uh, I hope you have a nice day as well, Sam. Just enjoy yourselves. Now I'm going to do a little story here today. This one's by Liz Arman. This, but it's called "But Westward." Look, the land is bright. One dark evening in the year 1906 in their cottage home in the village of Mousel, four young men sat around the kitchen table counting the contents of the clone pot spread out for them. The light from the oil lamp shone on the four urban heads. Their widowed mother sat by the fire watching them as they counted. Her aunts, usually busy with the everlasting knitting and so on, for once lay idle on her lap. Her heart growing heavier and heavier as the coins were sorted out in the small piles. Nineteen shillings and eleven pence and a penny. That's twenty shillings, another pound, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pounds all told. I think that's plenty. Five for my ticket and two for expenses, said John, eldest son. This magic sum represented freedom, adventure, prosperity, a life away from the grinding poverty that was a result of fishing in Mousel at that time. Competition from Scorne, caught from Scottish and East Coast fishing boats then working Cornish waters was fierce. These larger boats, sailing seven days a week, could travel further in the search for fish and would glut the early weekend, weekday markets, getting the best prices. No wonder scores of young Cornishmen were looking for a living in other parts of the world. Elizabeth Ellen knew that once John had bought his five-pound steerage, she would lose all her sons. Where John led, the others would follow, and she knew that they would. she would never see them again. Seeing her sad face in the firelight, John took her hands in his and said, Don't worry, ma. When I've met enough, I'll be back. I'll always look after you. It won't be forever. His mother knew differently. She already had one son who had left Mosul. Harry, named for his dead father, had joined the Royal Navy and was now with a ship in the Far East and Chinese waters. He was not likely to be back for at least five years. He was a poor correspondent. His letters were few and far between, although he had managed to send home a length of silk from Shanghai for his sister Liz's wedding dress. Unfortunately, he chose to send to a highly superstitious fishing family, which was considered poor luck, green. Eventually, the time came when Elizabeth Allen had to accept the inevitable, and so she waved a tearful farewell to her son John as he left Mosul, riding on, on the back of a cart, his few belongings in his feathers old sea bag, on his way to Liverpool, and from there to a brave new world 3,000 miles away. After a nightmare voyage packed with other emigrants like cattle in the bowels of the ship, with no privacy and precious little food, John landed in America. There was no luxurious for five pound steerage passengers. Passing through immigration at Ellis Island, he found the crowd, noise, and abrasive immigration authorities so overwhelming that he was glad to join up with a family heading for Detroit, Michigan, a city where so many corners had already settled. Michigan was to be his home for the rest of his life. There in Detroit, Mr. Ford had established his factories for the manufacture of the newfangled automobiles, and it was there that John exchanged his fisherman's life for hard and fast-boring production line job. Being strong and willing and used to work hard, he was soon marked for promotion. This meant money, regular and more plentiful than he had ever known. Soon he was sending home money regular for, to his mother, with a little bit extra for the clone pot, in which Thomas, Ernest and Edgar were putting every penny they could to scrape together for their tickets to fortune. The following year, 1907, Thomas made his way to the shipping agents in Penzance. In 1908, Ernest followed, and finally, 1909, saw Edgar making his way across the ocean to join his brothers. For Elizabeth Allen, four farewells, four heartbreaks. All three brothers followed John to Michigan, but Edgar soon decided to seek his fortune in the West, in California. Not for him the monotony of factory life. For a time, he tried gold money, but he certainly didn't strike it rich. And when an open came in a mine supply store, he took it. He found he had a bent for selling and eventually opened his own store. Of the four bachelors, three were quickly snapped up. Ernest, Thomas and Edgar all met and married brides of Cornish descent. 
They were sure of the Rebbe Keck and Pastas. All three were to have large families, but John remained a bachelor until his mother died in 1916. He kept his promise that he would support her and sent money home every month, but he found that even in the land of plenty, he couldn't manage to support both a wife and mother. The four brothers flourished in America. Their spacious homes and smart clothes were a far cry away from the humble cottage they had left behind. Only one, Ernest, was ever to return. <clears throat> After the Second World War, he came home with his son on the Queen Mary to see his remaining family, his sister Lizzie, the oldest of the family, and his brother George, the youngest. No steerage tickets this time. He had looked forward to introducing his son to the friends he had left behind. But unfortunately, none of them men standing on Mousel Cliff could remember him or his brothers. When they had all cast off so many years ago, they had cast off forever their old life. He had expected to find Mousel as he had left it, but so much had changed. Mousel was no longer the busy little fishing port that he remembered, and the granite war memorial bore witness of where his friends have gone. Did the four brothers miss their homeland? We know that they talked about it to their families. Every so often their grandchildren come searching for the roots. They take in Cornwall when they do London, Stratford, one of them, Edinburgh and Paris. Their reaction frequently is, Grandpa told us it was small, but we didn't expect it to be this small. How did they all manage to squeeze into a little cottage like that? One thing is certain though, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Allen, my great-grandmother, was right. Like so many Cornish parents at that time, when she said goodbye, she knew it was forever. She never did see her sons again. Take care of.